I'm fired up and I'm ready to go. I'm fired up and I'm ready to go. I'm fired up and I'm ready to go. This is the Billionaire Brown Experience. Let's go. Saving Grace Ministries is a safe haven foundation for children whose parents were murdered in, in the city of Camden and Philadelphia. So, All right, so I mean, safe we, haven. Uh, what you mean, safe haven? Because there's a lot of murders that happen in um, Camden and Philadelphia. Like, what do you mean right, by safe so haven? What I mean by safe haven is it's a safe place for them to come after the music stops. So once murders take place and the funerals take place and everything dies off after the funeral, people stop calling, people stop coming to visit. Nobody actually services the child's root of their issues as far as how they're dealing with bereavement. So we do many, many things. We have a community center they can come to for an after-school program from 3 to 7 every day. We have... um it's like a safe haven where they can come if they need someone to talk to, if they need a mentor. We have life coaches. We do um, bereavement counseling. We do group therapy. We do their Christmas. We do their birthdays. We do one educational trip a quarter as well as do things such as like purity balls for the girls to teach them about sexual impurities. We do like conferences for the boys. Um, we do fashion shows, different types of events for them to be involved in to keep them off of the street. So we also bring in a lot of motivational speakers, and we do, like, inspire conferences and things like that. So it's a lot that goes on to take place for them. This year, a new component to our ministry is we're opening four group homes um, with different demographics. So we have a group home for children aging out of foster care. They have nowhere to go because their parents are gone. We have a teen mom house for some of our teen girls who got pregnant when they were in the system. Um, we also have a home, a 15-day facility treatment home for children with PTSD. And then we have regular resource house that's just um, foster care placement. So Okay, sweet. Well, All right, now home. I got a few questions for you in regards to what you just said, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. Um, okay. What what is uh, I, I know, there's a few terms that you just used um, that I'm sure is very um, I'm probably not the only person that hasn't heard of them. Uh, what is a bereavement counseling like? What, what's that about? Our bereavement counseling actually guides the children through their stages of bereavement. So when their parents are murdered, they go through a lot of different emotional mishaps. So let's say, let's put it that way. So we walk them through the bereavement rainbow, which is like denial. Then we have like different stages such as this acceptance. And, you know, so each different stage of bereavement they walk through with certified bereavement counselors to teach them how to cope with their loss. So that counseling just specifically works on them coping with the fact that their parents are no longer here. Okay. So they do, they do different activities. Um. From like toddler to 21. As long as they're in school, they can stay in a program. Once they graduate from college, then they don't no longer stay in a program. They can come back to be a youth assistant because some do come back to work with us, but they're actually a part of their program until they're 21. Wow. Okay. So have you ever had a case where, let's say, the parent gets murdered, right? And mm -hmm. the child says, you know what? I don't really need it. They think that they're coping with it. But then let's say like six months or a year later, they, they start to see like they, they start to experience different feelings that they didn't originally feel. Are they still able to get plugged into the program or are you guys like, well, we offered you the opportunity when it first happened Our you know, our, our building is filled at this point? No. Whenever they feel the need, our doors are always open. That's why it's called a safe haven. Some children come to us and their parents may have been murdered four years ago. But mm -hmm. they know at this point in time, this is when it's affected my life. You have some children who don't really act on their emotions of not being dealt with until they're teenagers. It might have happened when they were 10. So we have, like, teenagers that begin to have derailing behaviors where they see themselves start having to be put in yes programs or in juvenile delinquent centers and stuff like that because no one ever dealt with the root of their issue. A lot of people don't ask the child how they feel later on or, you know, talk to them about what happened. So 
they hold it all inside. So it bottles up and then eventually they start finding coping mechanisms. And so they be on survival mode to survive. Or they feel like they have to take the place of the parent. You might have a son in the house that's like, now I got to become the man of the house. And then he start making wrong decisions. So Does he need, in that case where the son, let's say, you know, the father does pass away, you know, he gets murdered. And that mm-hmm. example you just said is what? Do you, how do you feel about that? Like, is that something that they do need that the, the kid does need to do, or is it in most cases something they don't, they shouldn't be doing? They shouldn't be doing. Now you have a lot of men, a lot of boys that feel like, okay, now I have to be the man in the house, and they shouldn't have to take that responsibility. Uh, however, they do. So, in the terms like that, so say men to their teenager, they feel like they need to take some responsibility off of mom. We do job coaching. We do different classes to teach them some of the things that they need to know. You want to know how to drive? Do you, are you, you know, reading where you need to be? Would you like to learn a trade? We have some men that may be carpenters or they might be engineers. What do you like to do? We try to get them involved in what they feel as though they can do. We try to get them little jobs and give them jobs or they can work for the program so that they can feel like they are being responsible, but we want, we don't want them to have the responsibility of being now taken rank like I have to be dead. Wow. Yeah. Because it kind of steals away their childhood at an early age, especially in Camden. The majority of the children that we have 433 kids at this point, and that's not a quarter of the kids whose parents was murdered, but you have the children now younger. Their parents are dying and they're younger. We have an enormous amount of infants who don't have a dad. So right now they don't understand what's going on, but a lot of the younger kids that's getting killed at 15, 16, 17, their kids are babies. So they don't really understand yet. Well, that's so what I was going to ask you about. Because I was thinking like the Alton, was that, is either Alton, Sterling, or Philandra, the, the guy that got killed in his um in his car with his daughter in the back? Right. I'm curious to know, like, do you have, like, I, I forget how old she was, but she was really young. So, like, is she affected in any way, or what, what part of the program would she be in? Well, the part of the pro- well, for our infants, we basically help take the load off of mom or whoever the guardian is at that time. We have a young lady who was killed, shot, well, she didn't die, who was shot at a party last year who is still recuperating and we're assisting the family with the baby at this point. So it's like, say for instance, that child. Right? You take care of the, you take care, okay, go ahead, sorry. You say for instance for that child. Like if a child that young, we may buy them, we might, you know, do pampers, we might do wipes, we might do clothes, toys. We have different activities where they can bring the kids and leave the kids and we'll have the kids for a while, you know, or if they need that child care assistance, you know, we can jump in with that. We have a child care department. So different things that we can kind of do to be a help meet to the parent that's now left behind with the infant. Mm. Because the infant is not grieving. The infant doesn't really know what's going on. You know, so we could just be a help meet to the families for the infant. Because we have a lot of them at this time. Okay, I like that. So it, it also, so you said that, that this young lady, uh, she didn't get killed, but she did get shot. So is this program also? So how does that work? Mm-hmm. I thought it was only just for uh, those that were murdered, but it sounds like there's more. Like it goes deeper. It's than more. That. Well, it's, it's actually will help me for families of victims of violent crime. And initially, uh, it, it, okay. it initially is only for children whose parents was murdered. However, you have some families that come to you when it first happens and before the person dies they might ask our prayer team to come pray with the person or come pray with their family and stuff like that in that case if the family dies or the family member dies we're already involved in the family so we may assist with the funeral we might you know assist with the repast or something like that because now they have gone on because they originally would tell they originally reach out to us when the incident happens so in some cases, the person might not die. They might still be there, but we have already intertwined with them as far as praying with the family and assisting the family during the time that they are in um, trauma. So with this young little girl, they didn't expect for her to make it, um, but she did pull through it. So we were already intertwined because we were called on to pray for her in the hospital. Okay. So we wanted to get in a time with the family. So now that she's trying, she's getting back at life or trying to get back at life, 
we've already been assisting the mother, the grandmother, the uncles, the father. We already had been assisting them from the beginning, from, you know, the first stages of us just coming to pray with them because we are a ministry first. So when they call on us, they call on us most time to pray for the families that have gone through the victims of violent crime. Yeah. Okay, and you, you, you explained how you, you expand, the, the program has expanded. Saving Grace Ministries has expanded from its original form, which that's what you said. Um, yeah. I guess everybody's probably gonna be, everybody's probably wondering right now, like, how did this Saving Grace Ministries come about? Was there a point where, you know, was there a fork in a row where it's like enough is enough? Uh, was there something that, uh, touched home for someone? Um, like, how did this, how did this begin? This began out of my own personal being a victim of violent crime. My husband was murdered, and he was shot 18 times, left 30 bullet holes. So, during the time that this happened, at the time we were raising one child, she was at age of nine, and when it happened, it was hard for me. Uh, we had just lost two children about two weeks prior to that. So I actually lost my children. Then I lost my husband. So in dealing with her and dealing with myself, going through the grieving process, there was no resources in my city. So in the city of Camden, there was nothing that was there to help me through my grieving process. It was nothing there to help my child. And knowing what she needed, because we actually rolled up on the incident as it ended or it was taking place, she had like nightmares, she had cold sweats, she was affected in school, socially she had got withdrawn for a while, it was different things, different things that she went through because of what happened and there was nothing in our city to help her. So I had to work to heal us both and when I say that I had to put a lot of money out going to outside of our city to get services. So to get the proper counseling, to get the proper therapy, to be able to put her in different types of extracurricular activities was expensive. So I wanted them to start double working to heal us. So when we came through a period where we were both okay, she went on to be, you know, she came out of our class at Camden High School. Then she went to college in Texas. I said to myself, like, there's something that I need to do to help parents like me because Camden murders double, triple every year. So... And I was like, I know it's a lot of parents out there who suffer like I did. What can I do, God, to help them? Because I need to bring these resources to the city. So I sat down and I kind of mapped out a program where I would bring these type of resources to parents who had to go through what I had to go through to assist their children. And in doing that, I just started to gain partnerships with outside agencies, with churches, with different um, sororities and Everybody, anybody who I can get partnerships with and say, listen, this is what I need to do for the kids in my city. And I just made it happen. You know, I just started working hard at it. It started out, I was assisting about 30 families the first year in 2011. And I went from assisting 30 to 433. So. Wow, that's really cool. And, yeah. um, all right, so y your daughter was nine years old um, when... It sounds like she was nine years old when your husband was murdered. Right. Okay. Shot multiple times, what, 18 times, 30 holes or something? Yeah. What? Right. Okay. He was shot 18 okay. times. He was 30 bullets. And, okay. And you mentioned that you guys came towards the end of it or at the, uh, or right when it happened? It was you and your right. daughter? It was, right. I was driving to my husband's job to actually pick him up from work. And we could hear the shots ringing out blocks away as we were pulling up to it. But when we pulled up to his, the front of his job, it had, like, just happened. Like, we was hearing it happen as we drove towards him. And when we got to the front, he was, like, in the middle of the street. So it was kind of a lot. It was really traumatic. Especially for so you, you guys were picking him up from work as normal schedule. You're driving. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to pick up Dad. Your daughter's there. You hear these mm -hmm. shots going on. You you obviously don't assume that it's you know your husband. So no. you guys get there. Both of you see him, or like how did that no. work? Like both. Of, so she saw him too. Yes, we actually when we pulled up to the front of his job, he was in the middle of the street. Was like a like a people around, like trying to assist him. The cop. It was like a cops that pulled up the same time we did. 
and they started asking me questions like, 